Okay, let us go to Ephesians chapter 2. I actually have a physical Bible with me in English. I usually have a Hebrew and Greek Bible up here. But this time I'm going to read from the physical Bible translation. <clears throat> so bear with me as I try to find, <laughs> find the right place. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verse... Uh, we're going to look at three verses, 11 through 13 here in Ephesians chapter 2. Let me read them. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands. <clears throat> remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We're gonna look from this text about exclusion and inclusion. Those who were excluded have become included, that's the title. Those who have been excluded have become included. Maybe you have felt excluded sometimes. Maybe you felt outside. Maybe you have friends who have let you down. Yeah. Maybe you have a group of friends who sometimes go out and have fun without asking if you want to come along with them. And then you feel the be alienation, you feel betrayal, you feel that you're outside. Maybe when you went to school as a kid, they had a birthday party and everyone else were invited except you. We're gonna think about this feeling here when we look at this text and again talk about exclusion and inclusion those who were excluded have become included paul reminds them here about how it was for them before remember that at one time you and in verse 12 he also says you were at that time and again in verse 13 once upon a time you were far off. He reminds them again about how it used to be for them. Paul has been talking about this since chapter 2. Since the beginning of chapter 2. He has talked about the truths of, of the misery of man. The wretched state that man is in. The deadness in sin. The being dead in sin and trespasses being dead toward god dead in the eyes of god living in sin but dead and in the absolute need for new life for regeneration this is what paul has been talking about their utterly hopeless condition that there was nothing they could do in themselves. They were <coughs> completely dead, unable, totally depraved. And all those things. He has really talked about this truth, this spiritual truth. But now he takes a step back and uses an earthly truth to illustrate this truth. And this is really the illustration God himself gives through the Old Testament, when he, he has his special chosen people, the people of Israel, the included ones, the included people, 
and then excluded all the other peoples, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, the, the heathens. They were excluded, but God had a special people that was included, that was exclusive. And all others were excluded. So Paul takes this. That was an illustration God used in the Old Testament to show a spiritual truth. And Paul expounds on this spiritual truth. And then he goes back again to remind again about how it was for you heathens, Gentiles. During the Old Testament times you were excluded once upon a time. Verse 12 again. That's literally what it says. Once upon a time, you Gentiles, this is about the, the state they were in. What he talked about before, the deadness in sin, was something that both Jews and Gentiles had in common. Although they were outwardly God's chosen people, they were Jews who did not believe, they rejected Christ, the Pharisees. All those peoples, Jew or Gentile, are born dead in their sin and need to be saved by grace, regenerated, brought to new life in order to be saved. So that truth is true for both Jews and Gentiles. But this truth Paul is talking about here is only true for the Gentiles. So he talks, talks about them. You Gentiles, that is the non-Jewish people, the, the, the ethnic groups, the ethnon in Greek, the peoples, nations, different ethnicities. This, this word is used about those in ethnicities who are not part of Israel, the, the Semitic yeah, the Jews, all the tribes of Israel. He, he talks to them here, according to the flesh. You were Gentiles in the flesh. Now some translations like the Swedish Bible says that you were by your biological inheritance. You were born as Gentiles. That it was... The, the word flesh here talks about the, the biological fact, not about the sinful nature. But then we have other, other commentators who point out that Paul uses Gentiles in the flesh, not Gentiles according to the flesh. Like we read in, uh, in the first chapter of Romans, we read that Christ was according to the flesh born of the seed of David. That doesn't mean that Christ was born with a sinful nature. It just talks about the, the biological heritage that he had from, from his mother. The, the human biological nature or biological heritage. He comes from the line of David according to his natural birth, his mother's side. But here, Paul, so that word that's used there is according to the flesh, according to the biological fact. But here, Paul uses the word Gentiles in the flesh. So this could mean, as many Reformed commentators point out, that they were not only, not only Gentiles in, in general. Of course, all Gentiles are in the flesh all people are born with a sinful nature in the flesh but maybe paul here especially wants to point out the fact that you gentiles were especially sinful you were especially fleshly carnal sinful you were gentiles in the flesh you were not maybe some people were better than you you nicer humanly speaking but you were especially evil and sinful in the flesh. 
you were called uh, the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision and here the the literal word that that is used is not uncircumcision it is actually foreskin the the word used for what, what you cut off when you circumcise um, a male child the foreskin is cut off so this word is used it is not as all english and swedish translation try to put it more politely they try to be more polite than than the apostle himself by writing it as uncircumcision they want to avoid the the word foreskin maybe that's a, a dirty word or an impolite word to use but we have to look at what, what does paul himself use here he uses the word foreskin and it's meant to be as a dirty word an ugly word a misnomer because it is what those who are circumcised are using about you the jews the circumcised people the israelites used this word to gentiles they called them foreskins not just uncircumcised but actually used this word to mock the gentiles to to uh, be disrespectful to them they it was meant to be a dirty and foul word used about this unclean those unclean people who are not circumcised they still have their disgusting foreskins left on them they haven't been refined they haven't cut off this this uh, ugly thing from them so it is you it was used by the U jews the people of israel as a mocking word uh, a, a way of deriding them and uh, may, maybe it's not wrong to do that for them we read for example about david in first samuel 17 26 <coughs> when goliath is there and he is mocking the people of god he is uh, taunting them he is mocking them he's mocking god himself david says he's mocking the the tribe of the living god the army of the living god the, the host of the living god and david says who is that uncircumcised philistine to to mock god's people so david himself uses this word to deride or to say to point out the disgustingness of the philistine that he's uncircumcised who is this foreskin to mock god's people so it was not a nice word to use and uh, gentiles were called this by the jews in a bad sense in a bad way this was how the 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 jewish people viewed the gentiles that they were a filthy people they were unclean people you couldn't eat together with them they even had the half jewish people the the samaritans who were not real truly jews they were half half israelites but more unclean people try to avoid them like jesus shows in his parable the the all the religious people pass from them go go away from them and jesus shows that samaritans can also be good samaritans as he says but even half jews were were viewed as an unclean people and more even more so the the greeks the gentiles the barbarians the romans the egyptians all the other all the other people who were outside the people of god the people of israel were viewed as unclean people they were the goy goyim and even 
to think of uh, we as Christians, we, we love to see people coming to Christ, to come into our religion. We like to mission, missionize, evangelize, witness. We want people to become Christians, to become part of our religion. But the Jews don't. They're very, very reluctant to allow a Gentile to become, to join the Judaic religion, to join their religion, because they're not part of that special people. They're very reluctant. They actually probably don't, don't even want others, but, but they let people become proselytes, but they're reluctant to, to bring them in, actually. And they were not allowed to eat together. And we even see in the, the first Christian church, the early church, how it was a great controversy. If could, could the Gentiles become Christians? Because the first church were Jewish. They were Jews in Jerusalem. They were Pharisees who had become Christians or other Jews. Jewish groups had become Christians. They, it was a Jewish religion. So the question was, and was very controversial as you read in the book of Acts, can, can also the Gentiles, the non-Jews, become Christians? So this has to be made clear by the Holy Spirit, as we read in Acts, when, when, when the Holy Spirit affirms the salvation of the Gentiles by having them speaking in, in other languages to signify, to show that God accepts people from other languages also, from other peoples also. And it was still very controversial. We even read about Peter in Galatians. Paul writes about Peter in Galatians, how they were in in the Gentile church with the Gentiles and Jews and Peter avoided the Gentiles because he didn't want to be a stumbling block to the Jewish Christians. So he, he set himself aside and only sat down to eat with the Jewish Christians and excluded the non-Jewish Christians. And Paul was there and he, he saw it, he saw this hypocrisy that Peter still had this, wanted to please men, and the Jewish Christians there still had this attitude that the Gentiles are maybe not, you know, maybe they can be in our church, but may, they're probably a bit more unclean. Maybe we as Jewish Christians have to avoid them. And Peter humored that and s stuck with the Jewish Christians, and it was a Peter knew that they were wrong. Peter knew that he himself had had this vision, as we read in Acts, that God has declared that which was unclean as clean, that no man is unclean, and that God also accepts non-Jews as Christians. So Peter knew this, but Paul saw his hypocrisy and openly rebuked him for his hypocrisy, showing that he was not walking according to the gospel even. So it was a great, great controversial thing even among Christians. We have to understand this, how, how, how were Gentiles viewed in the eyes of Jews and even Christian Jews who had come to, to repentance still had this this uh, sentiment in them. Of course, there is also anti-Semitism today. Basically, the other way around, or even worse, maybe the you know the, where people hate Jewish people because they are Jewish and they view Jews as unclean. But also, basically, that's a thing in human nature too. <coughs> to be xenophobic, to be mm -hmm. against other peoples than yourself, people who look different than you. 
but anyway, back to the text. The Jews here, they had this physical circumcision and they, they viewed the Gentiles, Paul's writing to here, as foreskins, something ugly, something unclean, something disgusting, something to avoid. And he says, by those who are circumcised, and he clarifies the circumcision which is made by hands. He talks about the physical circumcision. There is the spiritual circumcision, the, spir the circumcision of the heart that both Christian Jews and Gentiles have gone through. Like we read in Colossians 2.11, in whom you, in Christ, you were circumcised, not with the circumcision done by hand, by men, but by the circumcision of Christ when your sinful nature was put off. You were disrobed of your sinful nature. That's what the spiritual circumcision, the physical circumcision is just a picture of the taking off of the sinful nature. Romans 2.29, Paul says, Jew, you are Jew in, on your inside and by the circumcision of the heart that is, takes place through the spirit and not by the letter. And then you have your boasting, not by men, but by God. So Paul lifts up this fact that there is a spiritual circumcision there is a physical circumcision that that jews were very proud of as we have seen they were very proud of the fact that they were circumcised and those other people were dirty and unclean and they were boasting in their flesh by the physical circumcision that they had they were boasting in this, saw others as unclean. And Paul shows that those who are circumcised in the heart by the Spirit have their boasting by God and not by flesh. So then in verse 12, it was not, not only that they were excluded from Israel. Worst of all, it was that they were outside Christ at that time. They were outside Christ. This was before they were brought to faith. <clears throat> Worst of all. But we have read earlier that they were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. But, but at that time they weren't believers in Christ. They needed to have the faith in Christ Jesus and become grafted into Christ by their faith. So they were outside Christ, outside the anointed one, the Messiah, because they were outside the people of Israel. They were alienated, they were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, as it says here, or they weren't citizens. They were excluded from being citizens of Israel. They were excluded. They were alienated. They were viewed as aliens, strangers, sojourners. There are, uh, they were allowed to live in Israel as sojourners or as strangers, as we read in the Old Testament. The strangers were allowed to live in Israel, but they had to follow certain prescriptions. They had to keep the Sabbath. For example, the Sabbath commands says that on the seventh day, you're not allowed to do any work, neither your servant or the maid servant or your cattle, your sheep, your oxen, and not even the stranger who lives in your gates. That is the non-Jewish Gentile who lives inside Israel. Those were also had to keep the Sabbath, for example, and certain commandments. 
so they were not allowed as as full-blown citizens in Israel even if they were allowed to live there they were still there was a sense of being someone else being an alien being excluded being a stranger <clears throat> They were strangers for the covenants of promise because they weren't circumcised. They weren't part of that covenant where you circumcise, you enter that covenant by circumcision. So they didn't have those promises or again, they were strangers. These strangers mentioned in this covenant in the Old Testament. They didn't have the sense of Messiah as the Jews had. They didn't have the same hope, the same sense of hope in the Messiah as the Jews had because they didn't know about him. The Jews knew and believed that there would come a Messiah to save his people. They had the sacrifices, the rituals, the Gentiles did not have any knowledge of that. They didn't know that there would be a Messiah coming or anything about that. They were strangers to that promise, to that covenant. And then it says they were without God in the world. They were, did not have God. They had many false gods. Or maybe they could even be atheists. But they had, they didn't have the true God. The Greek word here used is atheos, which the word atheist comes from. They did not have God. Only the Jews had God. Only the Jews had the revelation from God. And they were the only ones who had a means to approach God by their covenant. But no Gentiles, no outside this covenant, there was no way for people to approach God. There was no covenant for them outside the covenant here of promise in the Old Testament. They were in, in the world. We read in the Old Testament about the world outside Israel, the nations surrounding you, the world outside, outside this included area. So there is no other way outside God's revelation, outside the covenant, outside Christ to come to God. As Jesus says, I am the way. And no man comes to the Father but by me. There is no way for Gentiles. There was no way for Gentiles outside Israel to come to God. And now there is no way for anyone to come to God but by Christ. As it was for the Jews, they had to approach God by Christ. That was typified in these sacrifices that they made. But now, these strangers, these aliens, these excluded people have been included. Verse 13, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. By their sin, they were far away from God. They were far off. It says in Isaiah 59 and 2, it is your sins that separate you from God. The sin makes people far away from God, far off from God, separated from God. They are far away from God. They are far away from Christ, as is mentioned here. You're, you were outside Christ. You were far away. 
And that's the worst thing to be outside Christ. They were without God, far away from God, godless, atheists. They were excluded from the people of God, from Israel. They were strangers. The people of Israel had their hope in the covenant promises. They had their circumcision that was the sign of inclusion, that they were part of this people of God. And the uncircumcised were viewed as unclean, profane people. They were far off. And then ver verse 14 mentions the enmity. We'll look more at that next, next time around. But they were enemies. They were far off and they were enemies, even enemies to Israel, enemies to God. But now he says... The great word but that we have seen earlier in this book. But God, you, you were this dead in your sins and trespasses. But God, you were far off. You were aliens. You were strangers. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It is in Christ Jesus that they have been brought near. And that was always God's purpose. It wasn't God's purpose that the Israel would just, the people of Israel would just be there and look down on the Gentiles and view them as unclean and avoid them. That was part of it. But God's purpose with Israel was that they were also to be a light to the people. To, to teach the people, the nations, the Gentiles, the right way. And first and foremostly, the land of the country, the Israel, Jerusalem, was a platform for the Messiah then to show up. To show up and, and do his work of salvation and save both Israel and and Gentiles. So Israel was to be the light to the nation, to be this platform, this, this area, this foundation for then the Messiah to come and save all people around the world, all people groups in the world. That was God's purpose. Because the Gentiles really, although they did not hope in the covenant promises they did not feel a, a hope they did not know about them they actually was hope for them in the covenant promises so we read about abraham the promise given to abraham about the messiah also included the gentiles the nations so in genesis 22 and 18 God says to Abraham, God promises to Abraham, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And he'll, here as Paul points out, God uses the word seed in singular. He talks about the one seed, the one man who would come from Abraham by whom all nations would be blessed that seed was the messiah christ and he would be a blessing to all the nations of the earth in thy seed in christ all the nations will be blessed all the nations will be blessed with eternal life as well so we see also that our Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1 and 20 that all the promises of God in him, in Christ, are yea and in him, amen. So Christ is the fulfillment of all these promises of God. This promise to Abraham that all nations of the earth will be blessed. Christ is that 
answer to the promise. Christ is the yea and amen that blesses the nations, that fulfills that promise. You who were far off have become near in Christ Jesus. You've been brought near by his blood. That was the hopelessness of the Gentiles. Not only that they were dead in their sin and trespasses, totally depraved, totally unable to move themselves to salvation, but they were also at a large distance from any knowledge of God, any revelation of God, any people of God, any hope in covenant promises. They were utterly hopeless, but in Christ and only in Christ it was possible for them to be born again, to be brought to new life, to have, be enlightened, to understand and to also be drawn near, to be included in the people of God. And most of all be brought near to God, to have access to God the Father as we read further on in verse 18 here for through him we both both Jews and Gentiles have access in one spirit to the Father so this is what it's what it's all about it's to be able to be brought near to God the Father and he also clarifies it's, it's not just in Christ in general it is in the or by the blood of Christ it is not without the gospel it is not without the death the penal substitutionary atoning death of Christ that they have been brought near to the father it was by the blood of Christ, that blood who took their punishment for their sins in their stead. That blood who removed the God, wrath of God, removed the enmity of God as Christ died in the place of sinners. Christ died for the ungodly as we read in Romans 5 let's read that Romans 5 and 8 through 10 they were Christ died for the ungodly verse 6 verse 8 but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life we were far off strangers even enemies but because god christ died for us christ's blood removed that wrath of god as he died for us for sinners both jews and gentiles He removed the enmity, the hostility that lied between them and God. God was an enemy to them in his wrath. God was the greatest enemy to mankind. And mankind was also an enemy to God in their rebellion. But Christ removed that enmity, that wrath, that estrangedness, that alienation that sin which separates them 
Christ removed that. He removed the enmity between God and men and also between men and men as we are going to look at from verse 14. He gave them forgiveness of sins. It is only by the blood of Christ that there is forgiveness of sins. Not even in the, the Old Testament covenants. The Israel that they were to sacrifice goats and lambs and bucks and oxen. Those, that blood, as Hebrew shows us, cannot take away sin. It is only by the blood of Christ that sin is removed and sin is pardoned and forgiven. So we're reading Hebrews 10 and 12. From verse 12 through 19, a longer passage. From verse 12 in Hebrews 10. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. It is finished, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering <clears throat> he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Remember the word covenant here and here. Talks about the inclusion of, of Gentiles also in this covenant as they are have the, the law in their heart when they have regenerated. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. And where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sins. And then by his blood, verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. So we now have talks about how we have access through God, he uses this language of being able to go into the holy of holies, pass through the curtain, this holy imagery that is in the, the temple. It's really an image of the access that we now have through the blood of Christ. We all have not only certain priests or Jews, but every single Christian by the blood of Jesus now has direct access, no priests other than Jesus himself and his blood, direct access to God into the Holy of Holies. So you who were once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, brought near to God. And again, this not only the Jews, but also the Gentiles. As Jesus says in John chapter 10. John chapter 10, 16 here, Jesus talks about his death for, the, for his sheep. His giving his life for his sheep. And he talks here to, to Jews, he talks about his elect sheep. Some are not his sheep, some are his sheep. He knows who his sheep are and he lays down his life 
for them. They know him, he knows them. And then he says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. And here maybe it's a bit mysterious who are these other sheep, this other flock. And uh, most scholars uh, makes most sense that he, Jesus is talking here as he's talking to the Jews. He's talking also about he has other sheep from another fold, not from the people of Israel, but also from the nations. He has his elect sheep scatter out among the nations and they are now included into his fold and they will become one flock with one shepherd and also we read in acts 2 39 where he says repent and be baptized peter says repent and be baptized for the promises the promise is to you and your children and all those who are far off, as many as the Lord our God calls. So he says here that those who are far off, the Gentiles, this promise of repentance to receive forgiveness of sin is also a promise that includes those who are outside Israel, those who are far off, they are now able to come inside to be brought near to God as well. We can also relate in a certain way in this time as it has become harder to get into countries or get out of the countries, or get into countries. We also see the hostility that is whipped up by the media, a hostility to those who haven't taken a certain medical procedure. Many, many of, I, I've talked to some of you, talked about how it is at your, your workplaces. If you haven't taken this procedure, I'm not gonna mention it because of YouTube, but you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't taken this jab, people at your work view you as unclean. They don't want to eat with you. They look down on you. They are suspicious of you. It's a, a hatred that is being whipped up toward certain people who haven't done a certain thing. It's li like you are lepers almost <clears throat> so we we can relate to this also have this as an illustration here or as we when we came back from sweden we had to take either if you don't have taken this thing you you have to show papers that you have taken it and if you don't if you haven't you have to take a very painful bloody sacrifice in your nose by shoving a sharp stick into your nostrils you have to feel that pain you have to to sacrifice something you have to show this outward circumcision now this illustrates the, the feeling of exclusion, but also the exclusion, the feeling of exclusion also after having been excluded and then to be brought in gives joy. So I'm not, I'm not uttering an opinion on, on this matter right here. Now, it's not necessarily wrong to exclude it's not necessary wrong to protect your society from outside corruption or outside dangers in generally speaking it's nothing wrong with being exclusive 
For example, the church, the congregation of God, the church is to be exclusive. Some churches you read on their their home pages or, or statements, they say that we want to be an open, including fellowship where everyone is allowed in, everyone can come as they are and stay the way they are. We are an open and loving and including community. And being exclusive is viewed as something bad. We're not to be too exclusive. But actually the church is to be exclusive. In this way, imagine exclusive associations or exclusive clubs i hope you don't you don't go to night clubs but some the the more finer clubs are exclusive you can't get in you have to be invited by someone who is all already in and otherwise you won't be let in if you go to other places they are not as good to go to The word exclusive has become synonymous with finer, nicer, better, more high quality. But that actually means, the word exclusive means that it's something that shuts others outside, to cl close others outside. We have the Freemasons also are an exclusive group. You can only join if you are invited by someone. Then we have open förenings. Like uh, there's a förening in Gothenburg called Trädgårdsföreningen. Which is a garden. You, it's open for everyone. You don't have to pay anything. You go inside. And it's not a very... I mean it's a nice garden but it's, uh, it's trashy. People throw stuff. People walk around and play Pokemon Go. It's not exclusive, it's not fine, it's uh, noisy. You can't rest there. Can't really enjoy the flowers. Or another example, think about a public restroom. Those who are exclusive, you have to pay to enter them. And those who are free to enter are pretty dirty not nice to go to but an exclusive public restroom that you have to pay to to go to you know that they take the money and and hire staff to clean them and not anyone can just go in and and make a mess in there you actually have to pay something to join it i want to say this as in the same way the people of God is exclusive because it is something that not everyone can join just like that. Israel in the Old Testament was exclusive toward Gentiles and in the same way the church now in the New Testament times is exclusive toward unrepented sinners. I mean, they can come here, come, come to the, the worship, sit here with us. Not exclusive in that way, but they can't become members. They can't take part of the sacraments or the ordinances. It's exclusive to them. They can't have this sense of being one of us. And this is meant by God to be a for taste or a picture of the eternal state to give a tangible feeling of the exclusion of eternity because we read we read about the new jerusalem that some people are inside but outside are the dogs we read that in the revelation the book of revelation there are some people are inside the new Jerusalem and some people are outside they are excluded those are those who have not repented and for them there is 
by then there is no way for them to join there is no way for them to get in the door is shut forever there's no way for them to get into jerusalem and the church in the same way is to be inside and outside exclusive some are outside some are inside but yet to give this feeling of exclusion in order to show them the eternal exclusion and draw them to repentance because the gate is not shut it is open for anyone who wills to enter in the same way to be excluded to be shut out but then to be allowed in by repentance by faith that gives joy it's not a joy why do all the churches that say we are an open and inclusive church why do they lose people why do they lose members why don't people want to come to them because it's nothing special nothing special there they're nice and inclusive and it's low quality but when there is an exclusive church that only those who fulfill the certain requirements of being saved can enter then that gives joy at least that's how it should be in times of god's grace in in times of god's grace upon a society it is uh, desirable to belong to the church of god to be part of the church of god and the, the worst the worst thing that could happen to you would be to be excluded of the church to be excommunicated think about old times what a great tragedy it was for a for a person to be excommunicated from the church to be outside but it, it's it's to be done church discipline is to be done to show them their grave state so that they may see their need to repent of the sin that they have committed i, I discuss church discipline more in, a, in another sermon that can be looked up online uh, maybe you as a christian you have to remember how it was for you always remember as paul here reminds us remember how it was for you and always use this memory to remember and rejoice in the gospel rest in the atoning work of christ and know that there was nothing you could do nothing you have done that you're better than someone else but you who were far off have been included by the grace of god by the blood of jesus and you can enjoy now fellowship with him and his congregation his people you know that you can remember your sin your uncleanness you were once uncircumcised in the flesh your sinful nature your sins have now been forgiven by grace you have no you had no right to be brought in but god brought you in by his grace maybe you still feel excluded in the world you feel like an outsider among non-believers among friends or at work and that's true as christians as hebrews 11 says we have confessed ourselves to be to be guests and strangers and sojourners here on earth that's how it is for us christians we're excluded from the world we're excluded we are strangers in this world but still we are included in the best fellowship that there is namely 
the fellowship of God and his church. The church will never let you down. The church should ne never let you down. We as a church should not let each other down. Remember also that church discipline is also faithful. To be a faithful friend is to discipline when you're in error. To show you the right way to rebuke you. But all who are not regenerate, who are not been born again, are strangers. Strangers to God. You are atheists, as this word in the text says. And maybe you are in theory an atheist. You say there is no God at all. Or maybe you're a polytheist. Everyone who are outside the true God are truly atheists. Because there is no God but the true God. You're e either a theist with the true, true God or an atheist. No matter how many gods you say that you have, you are still an atheist if you are outside the one true God. Maybe you are proud of your religion, you look down upon others as Muslims in their pride look down at, at non-Muslims, view them as pigs because they eat bacon. Those who eat pigs become pigs, it says in the Quran. Or maybe as Jews here in these texts, you look down on uncircumcised people. Or maybe as certain Christian denominations, you have to do these certain signs to show that you are a little better than someone else. You have to speak in tongues to show this sign that you are truly included into the in inner circle. But remember all you who are unbelievers, you are excluded from God's kingdom. You're excluded from his earthly kingdom. You as Gentiles would be excluded from Israel, from the people of Israel. Or now as unbelievers, you would be excluded from the church, from the kingdom of God called the church, the congregation. You're excluded from the kingdom, but what this reality is all about is that you are excluded from the kingdom of heaven for eternity. If you do not repent, you have no hope. Beyond this life, you have no hope if you are excluded. You will be shut out from the new Jerusalem. You will be outside. You will be outside in the place described as a lake of fire where all the Liars, all the adulterers, all the whoremongers, all the idolaters, all the cowards, all those people will be outside, those who still are in their sin. When the time of judgment comes, who have not fled to Christ, who have not been cleansed in his blood. By then it will be too late. The door will be shut. You will be outside in darkness where there will be crying and gnashing of teeth. But now when there is still time, the gospel is to be preached to all nations, to all creation. And all men without exclusion, without discrimination are commanded by God himself to repent to trust in Christ, but because he has appointed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has appointed, Christ himself, who died for sinners and rose again. Let us end with a word of prayer. 
Lord, we come before you and thank you for this truth. Lord, we thank you that you're not like, like certain people that exclude, that look down on unclean people and exclude them. But you have given a way for us to be included and you, your elect people, we, you have saved us. We were far off, we were excluded from all these wonderful things from your people, from the covenants, from the promises. And most of all, we were far away from you, excluded from fellowship to you because of our sin, because of our flesh. But now, God, that you have brought us near by the blood of your Son. O oh God, give us truth in our hearts. Help us understand this truth. Help us understand how this sense of exclusion and then rejoice in the fact that we have been ex included. Lord, the, the depressing sadness of being outside, of being excluded, and then the joy of being included. Lord, stamp this truth on our hearts, we pray. And Lord, we pray for those who are outside that they would come in, that you would br bring them in, draw them to yourself by your Son, by Christ, and include them. Bring them into your church. Bring them in among us. We pray that for your glory alone in Jesus' name. Amen.